Hey skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. Welcome to our weekly Top 5 Friday Ski Industry News videos. Uh, before we jump into the news, I have a pretty exciting announcement, um, and that is that starting next week, Bob will be back in the studio with me. Um, pretty much fully vaccinated over here at Ski Essentials, so we feel safe to be in the same room for these videos again. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that. We're going to have two reviews next week. Um, Bob will be here for both of them and we'll likely include Bob or another coworker in next week's Top 5 Fridays video. Um, so pretty exciting. I've been really waiting patiently to get back to that um, and I think that you will enjoy it just as much as I do. Um, so yeah, that said, let's get right into the news. Uh, the last solo news for a while, potentially. Um, so, first topic of the week, we have some ski racing updates. Um, you know, this is kind of the time of year. A few weeks ago, we kind of recapped the, the FIS Alpine race season. Uh, we've talked a lot about, like, overall winners and stuff like that. Um, definitely a transition now out of this past season looking ahead to next season and beyond. Uh, the men's and women's U.S. teams have begun training at Squaw. Uh, pretty exciting. Um, I'll get to why that's exciting in a little bit. Uh, Michaela Schifrin reportedly started training on Monday with the rest of the team joining throughout this week, and I believe the men's team is scheduled to arrive next week. Um, the reason why that's really exciting, you know, the fact that the U.S. ski team is training somewhere in a normal year wouldn't be that exciting, uh, but it kind of feels like, like a stark contrast to where we were last year, where training facilities were really in question, you know, basically everything was in question, um, and it was really kind of a struggle for the U.S. team to get their training time in, especially compared to European teams that had more direct access to snow. Um, so, yeah, just exciting that we're back to a little bit more normal of a situation now um, and exciting that the U.S. team is back on snow. You know, I think the U.S. team, as we've talked about over the past few weeks, I think they had a fantastic ski season this year, especially considering the, you know, reduced training that they had compared to some other teams. Um, so, I would say that all points to a positive going into the upcoming ski season. Um, I'm expecting some big things out of the U.S. team. Um, and then in another piece of ski racing news, we have some updates on kind of the discussions and the relationship between the U.S. ski team and the NCAA. Um, so this is something that we've talked about a few different times in past Top 5 Fridays videos and articles. Um, there has historically been a bit of a disconnect between those organizations. Um, we've talked about that quite a bit, so I won't get into the nitty gritty details there, um, but we have some new news from SkiRacing.com that there's a little bit of a changing perspective, mostly on the side of the U.S. ski team. Um, so there's been some realization that the collegiate system actually creates a huge talent pool, which is currently being really underutilized. You know, I think that's basically what we talked about last time we talked about this, this situation. Um, and nothing is yet set in stone, but it does feel like the conversation and the relationship is moving in a better direction. Um, and the U.S. ski team has said that they will, pretty much after all COVID restrictions are dropped, um, they will begin offering camps to collegiate athletes to better gauge their ability and their potentials. Um, so I think it's exciting that we're starting to see some early signs of those two organizations working more closely and just better with each other. Um, and it'll be great, you know, give, give collegiate skiers that or skiers in general, ski racers that want to get a college education and continue their athletic endeavors. Um, it, it, it creates a better situation for them where they have a potential path onto the U.S. ski team. Um, so definitely something that we will keep an eye on, but all, all good news this week. Um, second topic of the week, and in general this week kind of feels like we're circling back or like recapping some things that we've talked about before. 
This topic is surrounding the lingering impacts of the pandemic on workforce housing. So this is another fairly common topic for us on Top 5 Fridays. Um, workforce housing, housing in specifically mountain towns has been kind of a problem in, well, I'd say a while now, like decade or decades. Um, and basically the pandemic resulted in an explosion of real estate sales in mountain towns. You know, that's not new news to anybody. We've talked about that before. Um, that basically resulted in an immediate decrease in long-term rentals and compounding on that trend was the rise in Airbnb rentals and other short-term rentals. You know, it's like really popular and really trendy right now to have a short-term Airbnb rental, you know, whether you're a family that has uh, an apartment above your garage or, uh, you know, you're a second homeowner somewhere and you can rent that out. Um, but all of that is kind of taking away or not kind of is taking away from the long-term housing solutions for mountain town employees um, now what's new this week is we have a proposed infrastructure plan from president biden uh, which would include grants for workforce housing specifically in rural communities which pretty much encompasses like every mountain town. They kind of all fall under that umbrella. Um, and that could be really huge for mountain towns. You know, right now there's not like much financial business incentive to build long-term housing. Um, you know, it's not as big of an immediate financial gain for the investors. It's much better to have these short-term rentals um, in the immediate, you know, immediate financial return. So having some incentive from the federal government could be huge in kind of tipping the scales a little bit back towards workforce housing and, and, and affordable housing. Um, so that's definitely something that we will keep an eye on. We will definitely report on it as soon as there's more concrete news. Um, but yeah, hopefully, hopefully that that happens. You know, it's it's we're kind of uh, the trend that we're going on right now doesn't feel like the healthiest. Um, I've heard a lot of like anecdotal stories from people that work in say the service industry in mountain towns and they're kind of struggling to make ends meet. And you know, you you constantly hear stories of of just long term rents like skyrocketing. Um, we see it here in Stowe and and happens in a lot of mountain towns. So definitely one to watch. Um, third topic of the week, this is another one that if you follow Top 5 Fridays, you probably remember, um, but we have some updates from Granby Ranch, uh, which is a unique situation. If you remember, the homeowners put down a $10,000 deposit towards development that was to be refunded um, when the mountain or when the resort was sold previously, basically those that agreement kind of just like got thrown out um, and and became completely irrelevant. Now the update now or, or this week is that GR Terra has announced its intention to buy Granby Resort as well as the neighboring property. Um, and out of this comes some good news and some bad news. The good news is that the new owners seem pretty intent on developing the resort to its full potential. So that's something that we talked about last time this came up is the development had kind of had kind of paused, had kind of or at least significantly slowed down. So good news. Uh, the bad news is in this this purchase or, or this plan to purchase, there is zero mention of those $10,000 deposits in, in that lease purchase agreement, that initial agreement. So as far as we can tell, with no mention of that $10,000, we can only assume that those homeowners are not getting their deposits back, um, which is, you know, a, it's, it's not, it's a bummer. You know, if you're putting down $10,000 for the development of something that you're pretty invested in and you're not getting it back, um, not the greatest situation for those for those homeowners, um, but it would be nice if they 
you know, the, the resort that they bought into, that they invested into, becomes a, a full-fledged full-fledged resort, which would result in a better experience for them. Um, so we'll keep watching this. You know, it, it, things might change because nothing is put on paper yet. Um, they've only announced their intention to buy the resort, so you never know. Things could come up and things could change, and we'll let you know if they do. Um, fourth topic of the week, this is a pretty cool one. Uh, Japanese long jumper um, Sarah Takanahi, I believe it's Takanahi, uh, she wraps up her season with three world records. Uh, pretty cool when you can end a competitive season with three world records. Um, none of these records happened like immediately. They didn't happen within this past week, but they have officially been recognized by the Guinness World Record Organization. Um, so back in February, she took home a win in an event in Russia, which marked her 60th FIS win, making her the winningest female of all time and also the winningest long jumper of all time, regardless of gender. So there's two world records right there. And then at the end of March, she picked up a second at another event in Russia, which was her 109th podium of her career, which is another world record. So three world records, one season, um, and Sarah is only 24 years old. Um, in an interview, she said that she's setting her sights on the 2022 Olympics and also extending those records even further. Um, so pretty darn cool to see. Uh, Japan as a country has put a lot into the development of their of their ski teams and athletes. Um, and we're definitely starting to see that pay off. And, and I think Sarah is a perfect example of that. So congratulations to Sarah on all, on all, all your world records. Um, and yeah, looking forward to seeing you at the 2022 Olympic Games. Um, and then finally, we have our edits of the week. So first up, um, Level 1 has their Super Unknown event or Super Unknown finals going on right now. So we've got part one as well as part two of the Super Unknown recap. Um, we also have Real Skifi and Tenet, uh, which is basically like their take or reenacting the Hollywood thriller from 2020. Um, unbelievable. I watched it a few different times this morning and it just, yeah, it was just unbelievable. Um, we also have, I'm not sure if I'm going to pronounce his last name right, Hugo Mons. Um, which the only way I can describe this edit is he's on fire, literally. He's skiing and he's on fire. Um, it's pretty much all in French, so I don't have a great understanding of the French language, uh, but the, the footage itself is unbelievable. Um, and then last edit of the week is the Gronk's Spring Break uh, with, with Pit Viper. Um, so by the Gronks, we mean the Gronkowski family, uh, notably Rob Gronkowski, the famous tight end, the recent Super Bowl champ, uh, I guess go Tampa Bay Bucks. I don't know, hard to say that as somebody who lives in Vermont and grew up in Maine, uh, but it's cool to see Rob Gronkowski get another Super Bowl. Um, but yeah, they went skiing with the Pit Viper crew. Uh, Rob was on a pair of Armada Declivity 92s. It's pretty entertaining. It's very, very, very silly. Um, if you have any existing knowledge of either Rob Gronkowski or Pit Viper, you can probably kind of come up with a good idea of what this is going to be like, and you're probably going to be really accurate. Um, but I would encourage you to watch it, especially if you're, especially if you're a fan of Rob Gronkowski um, or Pit Viper. Uh, it's just there's nothing really to, that you can compare to the Pit Viper crew. Um, so, yeah, yeah, check that out. It's pretty unique. Um, and, yeah, that's it for Top 5 Fridays this week. Um, I know lifts are spinning some places in the country still, or I should say in the world. Um, Sugarbush here in Vermont is spinning their lift this weekend. I'm pretty sure Jay Peak is as well. So hopefully you guys are able to get out on the slopes, and maybe we'll see you there. Although, I think I'm going to hit the golf course this weekend, so probably won't see me on the slope slopes, uh, but we'll talk to you next week.